Uh, Mounts chapter 8, uh, t- I guess officially begins on page 55. Uh, we're going to skip the English part and I'll just talk about those matters uh, as we deal with the, the Greek issues. Uh, th- this chapter is primarily about prepositions in Greek, Greek prepositions. What is a preposition? A preposition is a word that uh, some linguists like to describe as a relational, a relational word. That is to say, a preposition draws a relationship between two things. What kinds of words in English are prepositions? In and over. Very good. So prepositions uh, in, in English could be things like in and over. Now, let's think about those for just a minute. Um, When I say uh, prepositions are relationals, they're words that indicate relationships, I might say something like in the car, okay? Um, Car is related to in in terms of indicating the place. But uh, this whole thing, this whole phrase is going to be used to relate the car to something else. So I may say something like... um, Uh, driving, driving in the car. So now car and driving are related to each other via the preposition. What does the preposition tell us? Okay, it tells us where, right? Driving and car are brought into relationship via this preposition that indicates where-ness. And uh, over is also going to indicate where, but in a different kind of place, right? So think over the rainbow. What, uh, what's over the rainbow? I don't know. Dreams? Dorothy? Whatever. Okay. So uh, I might say something like um, uh, clouds over the rainbow. So now what are being related to each other here via the preposition? Clouds. clouds. Yes. So uh, verbs can have prepositional (laughs) phrases like this that modify them, and nouns can do so as well. So as we think about prepositions and the things that the prepositions govern, we call those the object of the preposition. Those prepositional phrases can be adjectival or adverbial. They can modify a noun, in which case they're adjectival. They can be adverbial. They could modify verbs, and we're going to see that, um, you know, throughout our study of the Greek language. Now, uh, when we deal with prepositions, uh, prepositions uh, have what are called objects of the preposition, and that's what uh, these things are. The car is the object of the preposition in. The rainbow is the object of the preposition over. So uh, when you have prepositions, uh, they will have an object of the preposition. Um, There is a requirement in English that the preposition occur where in relation to the object of the preposition. Where should we expect that preposition to go? Before. And that's why they are called, you thought it had to do with prep school, right? Prepositions, yes, the, the, it's really pre-positions um, because position has to do with what? Something's position is its its place. And so pre-posed means placed before. There are languages that put the object of the preposition after the quote-unquote preposition. Uh, They would not be called prepositions in that language. They would be called postpositions. That's right. Or some people call them adpositions, so as not to prejudice where those things go. So a preposition and a postposition would be an adposition. Does anybody know a language or speak a language where the preposition comes after the object of the preposition? No? I understand that several of the Asian languages do this. So instead of saying in the car, it would be the car in. Or maybe car the in. So I... I'm not uh, entirely certain. I don't speak any Asian languages. So anyhow, uh, this is going to be true in Greek. Greek is going to have prepositions, 
And even though Greek's word order is fairly free, it isn't with respect to the prepositions. You're not going to see the object of the preposition in front of the preposition in Greek. They're going to go uh, after. All right. Now, um, let's, uh, let's start looking at uh, the actual matter of, of Greek's prepositions. And um, what I want to do is just introduce you to uh, this concept here. Uh, let's take the preposition N. Okay. Uh, what does that mean in Greek? In. This is one of your vocab words. I think you got this, what, chapter four or three? Uh, anyhow, one of the things that we're going to learn about Greek is that prepositions in Greek will be in a particular case. You can't just put a preposition's object uh, in any case you want. The preposition is going to require the object of the preposition to be in a particular case. So who knows what case the object of the preposition in n will be in? It'll be in the dative case. So let's uh, let's look at an example here. Yeah, uh, <coughs> people will wonder why does the dative case uh, follow the preposition n? It's just because that's the way the language is. Um, now, n is a preposition where there's only one case that the object of the preposition can be in. So here we have n to cosmo. So say that with me, n to cosmo. Now that's uh, what case is cosmo here? Data, you see that iota subscript, that's data singular, right? You see to is the article, it also is in the data of case because the, the article will always follow the case of the noun that it goes with. So in the world, in the world. So n, I will write some things like this, n plus dat, that means the object of the preposition n occurs in the data of case. Now, uh, it's wonderful when prepositions only occur with one possible case for its object of the preposition. But that isn't always the case, pardon the pun. There are others, uh, for example, ace. Ace, what case will its object be in? Anybody remember this? No, good guess. It'll be in the accusative case. You've, you've got really a one in three chance here. <laughs> the one case your object of the preposition will never be in is the nominative case. Okay? Yes? Is it important to learn the case that a preposition goes with if it only has one? Absolutely. In fact, you should learn the case that its object can be in for, for all possibilities with that preposition. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, there, there's, a, there's a good reason for that as well. If you know what the case of the object of a preposition is, even if it's just one possible case, then when you see that preposition, then you want to be looking for the case that its object goes in to tie those together. Because sometimes you might have some intervening material and you'll lose sight of what really belongs with that preposition. Okay. Now, so ace, uh, what does ace mean? Anybody remember that? Uh, to or into, that's right. Typically, it's used with motion. So he went into the city or he went to the city, okay? So if I were wanting to say something like he sent Jesus into the world, it would be ace and then not to cosmo because that's data. Uh, ace takes the accusative, so it would be en ton cosmon, right? And so there you go. Uh, now, uh, those are situations where prepositions can take a single um, case for its object. But then we have some prepositions that are a little bit naughtier, and they try to confuse people like you, first-year Greek students. Let's take a look at the vocab list. I want to show you how to know whether a preposition can take just one case or multiple cases for their objects. Now, look at apa. 
the, the word Allah, of course, is, is, uh, is not, a, not a preposition. We want to look at the prepositions. So, so we have a pa here. You've actually seen this word before, haven't you? Um, what is the case that its object will be in? The genitive. So notice here that in my list so far, I have n, as, and a pa. Each of them take a different case for its object. Can you predict? Not necessarily, although I will tell you that um, places that indicate a location or prepositions that indicate a location, th those tend to, to occur with the dative case. And um, separation sort of concepts tend to occur with the genitive case. And you'll see more of that later. Now, uh, apa means what? Away from. away from. So from or away from. Now, the next one is dia. Dia. Now, I don't think we've seen this one in the past, have we? Maybe you've seen it in your homework and he's given you a translation. Uh, now, when a, uh, a preposition can take multiple uh, cases for their objects, then I will uh, jot down things like this. And, and here's the deal, okay? When a preposition could occur with its object in the genitive or the accusative case, the meaning of that preposition is going to vary. So what does dia plus the genitive case mean? It means through. And what does it mean if it's followed by an object in the accusative case? On account of, okay? Or because of. These are very important. Think, for example, you don't really know the genitive case of or the accusative case of the word for faith. But Paul will say things like we are justified dia pisteos. Genitive case, dia plus the genitive of faith. So what's he saying? Yes, that it's through faith that we're justified. It isn't because of faith that we're justified. What's the cause of our justification? It's Christ, and it's his work. It, it, he doesn't look at my faith and say, ah, I will justify you on account of the faith. Rather, it's through the faith, you see. So getting, getting your prepositions and their objects of the preposition and the meaning with those uh, cases uh, correct is, is really uh, important, okay? Now, <laughs> we, we come to Eck. Those of you that uh, remember Luther, you might remember the name Eck as a... Uh, as one of Luther's Catholic adversaries. This is not how you spell ek, by the way. But here it is. What case will its object be in? Genitive. That's right. Now, uh, there are some alternate forms with these based on what comes after the preposition, but I'm just wanting to uh, help you see that uh, with these, there's only one case that X object can be in, and that'll be the genitive case. Um, and what does, what does that have uh, the sense of? That's right, so from or, or out of. All right, very good. Um, you might be wondering, what's the difference between ek and apa? There will be some places where they seem to have an overlap in meaning, but if you're inside of something and you come from the inside to the outside of it, uh, that's going to be ek and not apa. All right? Uh, if you're going from one place to another, then... You, you would expect to see a pa that, but you could see ek for that as well. Now, um, the next page, we have uh, meta, meta. So go there, meta. How many cases can this preposition govern? Two. Two. And what are they? Okay, so we could have genitive or accusative. And what does it mean when it's followed by an object in the genitive case? Okay, so we have with here. What about the accusative? After. All right, great. So with that in mind, uh, I want you to notice that dia plus its accusative has a meaning that has an A in it. 
Meta plus the accusative has a meaning that has an A in it. You might find that helpful as you're trying to think through how to memorize these things. Okay? Dia plus the accusative on account of. Meta plus the accusative after. All right? So with or after. So if I wanted to say um, we walked with uh, the apostle, what would that look like? Well, it would be meta and then to apostolu. There we go. So apatu apostolu with the apostle or after the apostle meta tan apostolon. There you go. All right. Now, uh, here uh, we keep keep going. We have para, para. This one is the one I like the least, and you probably will like the least also. How many possible cases can we find? Yes, all three. Notice which case is not shown up yet. The nominative, because you'll never see a nominative case noun governed by uh, any preposition. Okay? So we have genitive, dative, and accusative. All right. So uh, genitive from. Remember how just a little while ago I said if there's this idea of coming from something, you would typically see a genitive idea, right? Uh, dative, beside, or in the presence? I mentioned location. Often it has dative. And then with the accusative, alongside of. Now, it really is going to matter then when you come to the word para, you got to find the case of the object. And... Um, you can't really translate it until you've discovered what that case is. Uh, three. This one's a nasty one. All right. And then uh, the last one is hupa. Hupa. How many possible cases will we see here? There's two. What are they? Genitive and accusative. So when hupa is followed by the genitive case for an object, what's its meaning here? Okay, by as in, we don't know verbs yet, but passive verbs where some subject has some action performed on it. John was eaten. And in, in Greek, if I wanted to say by squirrels, what case would squirrels be in? It'd be genitive, hupa plus the genitive case. Okay, so this this sort of of um, of hupa here with with the genitive case is indicating what we would call the agent in a passive verb. The subject of a passive verb is not doing anything. John was eaten. Is John doing anything? John doing the eating? John was eaten? Nope. Okay, so he's not the agent. He's not the actor. But if I say John was eaten by squirrels, squirrels are the ones doing the eating. They're the agents. Yes? It seems like the preposition supersedes the keywords a lot of times. Yes. That's, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was going to be one of the things I, I was going to say. And, and it's, it's that whenever you have a preposition, then you're going to see these dative and genitive case nouns. Forget the keywords. It's the meaning of that preposition that you're going to put right before the meaning of the noun, okay? So if I say hupa, um, uh, hupa, uh, I don't know, tu anthropu, then that would be by the apostle, not by of the apostle, okay? So drop the keywords and use the meaning of the preposition and, and then whatever that noun, that noun is in that case. Now, what does hupa plus the accusative mean? Okay, good. And um, 
you've probably uh, heard of hypoglycemia and uh, hypodermic needles. These are things that are below or under something, right? And uh, that's, that's from this, this Greek root. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, we skipped pros. This is one of our vocab words. What's pros? Okay, two or towards. And what are the possible cases here? Accusative and? and? Just accusative. Yay! That's wonderful, right? So to or towards. So with uh, the meaning that you see here, what sorts of um, things will you expect to see with pros? Verbs of motion, movement, okay? Which does make um, the... Uh, the beginning of John's gospel sort of interesting. I'll pull that up here real quick just to show you. John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, why don't you read this with me? Shall we do it together? Ready? En arche ein halagas kai halagas ein prastan theon kai theos ein halagas. All right, very good. So uh, notice, what is that preposition? N, and, N is going to take its object in what case? Data. Notice RK is a first declension noun, and what do you see here? Well, whoop de doo there's a Yoda subscript. So in beginning, that is in the beginning. Now this, was, this is one of your new vocab words, ain, what's that mean? Was, and what is the subject of was? Well, yes, but I mean, in your vocab word, he tells you it's he, she, or it was. But I actually have a noun in the case for a subject, don't I? So I'm going to use that as my subject and not he, she, or it. So in the beginning was the word, or the word was. And halagas ein, what's that? The word was prostantheon. Ah, now, we didn't learn uh, with as a meaning of pros, did we? Yeah, to or toward. But is ain a verb of motion? No, no. So using this preposition with a verb that's not a motion verb then ought to then tell you, I can't really translate this as if it were a motion-related type of preposition. So I would want then to pull up my lexicon and say, huh, what else could pros possibly mean here? And then you would see that in situations like this, it could also have the sense of with, okay? And notice what case is tante on? Accusative. Why? Because pros requires that, and I won't see its object in any other case. So this, this is a nice one. <laughs> Only one case I have to worry about, all right? And then finally, kaitheos ein halagas, and the word was God. Okay? Uh, now, um, this is going to be very important for you. You're going to learn some barebone meanings for the prepositions that you come across, but realize that prepositions in any language are really some of the hardest things to master. You think about English prepositions. Well, think about the preposition with. That's susceptible to several meanings. Let me give an example where, where ambiguity ensues. I could say something like, Bertha broke the window with her brother. What's the meaning of with there? Okay, yeah, she could have thrown him through the window. <laughs> And when I say Bertha broke the window with her brother, that means that she used her brother to accomplish it. That is a with of means. She broke the window by means of her brother. Or what else could the with mean? Together. Yeah, together. Accompaniment. The with of accompaniment. See how English's prepositions can be subject to, you know, different, different meanings. The preposition to in English has a ton of different senses and possibilities. So if you were a non-native English speaker, and you came to some of these less normal 
um, possibilities for the preposition to, which normally we think of as movement towards something or a direction, a goal, what would you want to do? You'd want to look it up in an English dictionary and say, okay, what are the possibilities here? You're going to have to do that with your Greek prepositions as you start reading the Greek New Testament, okay? Don't think that because you learned the two meanings of ek that you've got it all, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of other possibilities. Ek could be causal, because of something. Ek could be part of, some of this, and so forth, all right? Now, having gone through the little vocab list, looking at the actual prepositions we have, there's one thing that I hope you notice. The prepositions themselves are, for the most part, um, frozen forms. That is to say, we don't vary the form of the preposition in the same way that we vary the forms of nouns to reflect case. All right? It's going to change its form when it does, because other consonants and vowels around it will, will cause those changes. Those are phonetic changes, okay? Phonetics has to do with the interaction of sounds. So let's take a couple of examples. Uh, we had a pa, okay? And this is reflecting um, 8.6 in mounts. We take the word a pa, again, what does that mean? Away from, away from. And you're going to notice that there are two other possibilities for how this preposition will look. Okay? Could be op and off. What, do, what are these things called right here? Those are apostrophes. And what are they reflecting? Elision. That's right. This Omicron could end up undergoing elision, and it falls out. Now, under what circumstances does that happen? Yes, if the next word begins with a vowel. Now, when will I have to make a choice between a P versus a phi for that, that normal, what would normally be the P? Depends on, yes, the, the matter of breathing. So, if I have a word like uh, amu in the genitive case, and it's got a smooth breathing, then I'm going to leave the P B. If, on the other hand, I had a word like horus, which is genitive case, and rough breathing, the P changes to the phi. Think about that. If I have a P immediately followed by an H sound, P and H, Puh, what's it going to do? It's going to become the fuh sound, isn't it? So basically, it's an, that, that P is anticipating the rough breathing, and it, it creates this fuh. All right? So we're going to see things like that. Um, let's see. That was a paw. What were, what were some of the other ones that we saw here? Oh, how about dia? Dia. Notice that dia ends with a vowel too, doesn't it? So when I have a, um, a, uh, a word that begins with a, another vowel, then that, that alpha is going to drop, and I'm going to get that, um, that uh, apostrophe there. Okay? Um, all right. So just want to make sure that, that that sort of stuff is clear. Uh, the, the breathing mark really, really matters for some of these forms, okay? Any questions about this?